This is shocking. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And our lead story today, Fidelity, is about to do the unthinkable. And what I want to know is if you are faced with the same decision, and I'm going to give you all of the data, would you do what they're about to do? Plus, we have a sponsor for today's show, LQR House. They're the digital face of the alcohol space. You can find them under the symbol LQR on the NASDAQ. And they recently had an analyst put a buy signal on their stock with a target more than double its current price. I'll show you why. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now let's head over to Bloomberg where he picked today's story up with a headline as Euro area inflation slows more than expected with 2% in view. Now we know that global central bankers want to bring inflation down to 2%. Of course, if you're expecting big wage growth in the future, well, if companies can only raise their price at on average about 2%, don't expect big wage growth, but one of the challenges here is we're seeing this thing move down quicker than the experts and political elites thought. We told you this was going to happen. The problem is they're getting surprised. As inflation is undershooting analyst expectations across the 20 nation euro area, following the ECB's unprecedented ramp up in interest rates. Output is waning as well. However, gross domestic product shrank 0.1% in the third quarter, leaving the region teetering on the brink of a recession. And of course, we've made the case that the German manufacturing sector is in an outright depression, and that would pull down the entire Eurozone with it. We're seeing that beginning to happen. The frightening part here for central bankers is, is when inflation overshoots their targets to the downside, watch them cut at a rapid rate because the issue here is they've constrained the money growth in these industrialized economies to the extent that demand there just isn't enough money to support all the demand and that means demand continues to fall and with that so too does inflation as the french economy unexpectedly shrinks while inflation eases here we have this unexpectedly term again nobody thought the global economy would continue to shrink everyone believed that as long as people are employed that they would remain strong spenders in the economy and the demand would remain robust one of the challenges that these political elites do not understand is just because you get a pay raise doesn't mean you continue to get the hours work that you want Employers often will give out raises and then trim hours as demand falls and then eventually begin to lay people off. We said this was going to happen, and here it is. As gross domestic product fell 0.1% in the three months through September, revised down from a similar size gain initially reported. There was a better news on inflation, which eased to 3.8% this month, the lowest level since the start of last year, following October's 4.5% reading. This is a challenge because what it means is that inflation is going to continue to fall. What these political elites do not understand is when you constrain demand by constraining the growth of money in the economy, economy. You take away people's ability to borrow money, you reduce the amount of money in this system, then what happens is demand falls. We start to take a look at the manufacturing sector here. Let's go to some U.S. data because we can predict ahead of time that inflation was going to come down. But again, these experts, they don't see it. And we're looking at the current general activity indexes for the Philly Fed in their manufacturing sector against the consumer price index in red. That's shown on a year-over-year -year rate of change. And what you can see is throughout history, and we're going all the way back to the 1970s here, and this is what we love about the Philly Fed data, is we got a lot of it. So you can see when the manufacturing sector slows down and when it goes negative, that means it's under that horizontal black line. Normally with the lag, you see inflation come down, and then the sector shuts shot up as demand went up, and then it came plumbing down in 1975. What happened? Inflation with the lag came down. You see that in the 80s. So this, again, was in those big years of inflation that no one thought you could get it under control. Well, if you bring demand down enough with a lag, inflation does eventually follow. And as we move more into a globally synchronized economy, what happens as demand come down, that lag between the fall of inflation 
gets shorter and shorter. Here you can see as we move into the dot-com bubble, demand in the factory sector crash, inflation fell in the global financial crisis. And then you can see it along the way here, kind of around 2012, 2013, you see demand coming down, inflation fell. You see it around 2015, 2016, the same effect. You see it ahead of the pandemic and you're seeing it now. So it's all about demand you get rid of demand inflation comes down and it comes down in a rapid way now particularly as you're about to see here in a little bit when you have more people on unemployment something we've been warning about and that's about to get out of control too as the U.S. economy slowed in the recent weeks with inflation and labor cooling, even real disinflation-adjusted consumer spending rose a mere 0.2% after September was revised down. And this puts the Fed on hold for now, but their pivot to rate cuts is getting closer. Inflation is clearly slowing. The job market is softening faster than expected. This according to Bill Adams, the chief economist at Comerica Bank. But what this tells us is he's right. The job market is indeed slowing faster than the experts thought because these political elites believe that they could bring price growth down. They could slow it down without any impact in the broad economy. The problem is when you reduce demand for something, you reduce the number of people you need to manufacture that or ship that or produce it or sell it. You need fewer people. And when you have fewer people, well, those means the spending goes down as well. The core personal consumption expenditures price index, which strips out the volatile food and energy components, rose a mere 0.2% last month, that according to the BEA. From a year ago, the Fed's preferred gauge of underlying inflation advanced at a mere 3.5%. As we approach, of course, slowly, but we're moving closer to that 2% target. And we start adding all of these things up. Wait till you see what Fidelity is about to do. It makes absolutely no sense. Meanwhile, the overall PCE price gauge, that's personal consumption expenditures, was unchanged from the prior month. That means it was at zero on lower energy prices. And on an annual basis, it's running at 3%, the smallest gain since March of 2021. Now, it still happens to be above the Fed's 2% target. But if we've noted throughout history, you don't get an immediate rapid drop of inflation from a high number to a very low number. It does take time. The key part here is we're on our way. The issue will be is when we hit it, there will be a brief celebration by the Federal Reserve and all the other policymakers around the world. And then when it comes crumbling down below that, you're going to watch him go into all out panic mode. And one way we know demand is falling is we can see that in crude oil prices. Here we've got West Texas Intermediate. And in yesterday's show, we talked about how demand for distillates plumbled a ton as inventories were building over 5 million barrels and gasoline bill inventories were up as well. But here you can see that if the Fed wanted to know where inflation was going, all they have to do is look at West Texas Intermediate. Here you see it on red against personal consumption expenditures, the chain type price index, both on a year over year rate of change. And we know what that tells us is that recent bump of inflation is about over and likely to come down even more. And where energy goes, an economy falls because when an industrialized economy uses less energy, it tells you demand is shrinking and that everything else will follow suit. In fact, it's even so bad, even Circle K says that they see consumers are not spending. As owners' results take hit with consumers retrenching, we definitely see some belt tightening across the markets and regions, as according to the CFO, and what customers have been impacted in the past 12 months by high levels of inflation and now high interest rates. The issue here with Circle K is fewer people are buying gas, fewer people are going into the convenience stores, they're moving around the economy less, and that means their sales are down as well. As same store merchandise sales in the U.S. slid 0.1% and dropped 0.2% in Europe in the fiscal second quarter. This is an issue. You look around, so you're seeing, what do we see? A slowdown in the U.S., a slowdown in Europe. How about the rest of the world? Well, we'll get to that here in a bit, which will make Fidelity's move even more surprising. As U.S. continued jobless claims now jump to the highest level since late 
2021, which is staggering. Of course, we're still coming out post-pandemic world here in 2021, but the issue is we've made the case. When people are unemployed, on unemployment and they stay on unemployment, that is continued claims, that means their spending power is reduced. Because if you lose your job and quickly get another one, there is a minor impact. But the longer someone is on unemployment, that means their discretionary spending goes way down because they still have to pay for rent food and energy. We know energy prices have been a little up recently. The other problem is they've got debt. And of course, we just looked at some of the Black Friday and Cyber Money sales telling us that consumers were saying, look, I'll take that now and pay later. The problem is we're starting to wonder is, will they even be able to pay later? Continuing claims, which are a proxy for the number of people receiving unemployment benefits, rose to 1.9 3 million in the week ending November 18th, beating all estimates. The figure has climbed up September, suggesting that out of work Americans are finding it more difficult to secure new employment, despite the fact that the government claims that we have a ton of jobs available in their reports. We said that's likely bogus. The evidence is supporting it because where continuing claims go, initial claims follow. And the math here is really simple. The longer people are on unemployment, the more impact they have on the fact that their income is down, means less spending in the broad economy, that's less spending hits, that's a reduction in demand, and that means more people hit the unemployment line. And you can see it in evidence in this chart here. We have initial claims in blue against continued claims in red, and we can see where continued claims go. The blue ones follow, so initial claims definitely fall higher here. You can see it in almost every instant, and now we're starting to see a breakout of that continued claims over the recent high that means fewer americans going into the holiday season when we've heard about all these jobs available well apparently they're not there and overall the labor market remains resilient but thursday's figures are the latest indication its strength is ebbing and this is something the central bankers were holding so tightly on is the robustness of the labor market and we said look you cannot reduce demand and maintain labor businesses will not keep employees around if they don't have work once they get through their new orders and then they get through the backlogs if the new order bucket doesn't quickly refill the layoffs were going to happen. And if in retail space, if you don't have foot traffic because people don't have access to credit and don't have cash to spend, well, that means you need fewer people on the floor working there, fewer people in the transportation sector, fewer people across the board. And unemployment has started to tick higher, even if it remains historically low and wage gains have cooled. Although some businesses, particularly in the trades, are still struggling to fill open positions, the urgency to hire subsided more broadly across industries because what happens is even people that want to hire, when they look around and start to see the economy slow, they put a question mark on that decision and slow the process down because they don't want to end up hiring someone and turn around and have to lay them off. But does the Federal Reserve, do they even think that there's a possibility that they went too far, they inverted the money curves by too much for too long? Well, the answer is no, they don't see this as a problem at all. As Fed's Daily says, rates, they're in very good place, not considering a cut at all, she says. And how about Fed's Williams? He expects policy to stay restrictive for some time. He said, even though it's the most restrictive in 25 years. So here you can see these political elites are completely clueless about how the global financial system works. They don't understand that in a debt-based economy, when you have a massive amount of debt and you still want to hit your growth targets, that you need the money centers, the commercial banks to get out there and lend. And by inverting the curves, by driving short-term rates, up higher than long-term rates, what they've done is effectively keep the commercial banks in a position that if they lend, they lose money. And if you've ever owned a business, well, that's not how you stay in business. So the banks do the simple thing is they cut lending, they cut the money growth. And when you have a lot of debt and you don't have enough money to support the growth, well, on our system, the debt gets prioritized. That's why you start to see when there's not enough money, delinquencies start to rise, and then defaults come along, and you see unemployment claims start to rise. It's all happening. The reason we're seeing this lag, the reason it took so long, had everything to do with the pandemic stimulus. And this is what makes it even more surprising, as you're about to see what Fidelity is about to do. As Fidelity and Vesco prep for revival, 
and China's beating up markets. Now, we've been talking about China a lot here lately. As you know, there's been a lot of information coming out about their property sector, the banking sector, how, of course, Beijing is panicking about the slowdown of their economy and how just on the surface, their economy is suffering because of the global economy is slowing down. Remember, when you're the world's largest exporter, you need people to buy your stuff. So as you look at this headline and we go back to it, you think, wait a minute, is China's market beaten up? Because as an investor, well, one thing you're looking to do is buy low and sell high. And if you hire a money manager such as Fidelity, what you're expecting them to do is make that decision for you. The question is, is China really at a bottom now? Is this the soft landing that everyone's been looking for and we're gonna see a revival in the Chinese economy? Or are they about to make a massive mistake? You be the judge. Encouraged by clear growth support signals from Beijing, increased stimulus for embattled developers and attractive equity valuations, the portfolio manager for Fidelity International is scouring for opportunities again. So here you can see they believe, she believes, that the bottom now is in the Chinese economy, that the stimulus that Beijing is offering and putting out to the banks that we talked about in the show the other day is going to work. And she's not the only one. We're looking to increase our exposure in a measured manner. Wang, who helps manage the one and a half billion global thematic opportunities fund, said in a recent interview, it has become clear to investors that economic growth is once again firmly a policy priority when what she's saying is, look, we believe in the power of stimulus and central banks and that governments can turn the economy around. Look, it doesn't work that way. Economies are so big now that you can make a change and the trajectory of the economy will not have any impact for quite some time. And if you don't make a big enough impact, the economy may move downward so much it doesn't even notice. It just might even a speed bump in the direction downward. But yet, what what you're seeing is everybody believes in stimulus, but let's take a look at what's really going on in China. Because again, I want you to make the decision. If faced with the same decision of looking for opportunities to invest, would you pick China? As China's factory services activity shrink in a snag for recovery, but wait a minute, Fidelity says this could be the bottom here as manufacturing PMI fell to 49.4, the second straight month of contraction. While economists expected a decline, the number was lower than they thought. So here's what happened. We saw the global manufacturing sector come down and then it bounced a bit, which we said would likely happen due to the back to school and the holiday season coming and then wait if it starts to roll over again, watch out below. And sure enough, that's what's happening in China. Now remember, what comes out of China eventually hits US retailers. So we're seeing demand coming out of the US shrinking, causing problems again for China. A gauge for the non-manufacturing activity or the services sector unexpectedly eased to 50.2. Remember, 50 is the mark which indicates an expansion or a contraction. So a 50.2, you have just the very smallest expansion you can get over the prior month. An underlying measure of services activity fell to 49.3, the first contraction for that gauge this year, invalidating what we have said. Where the manufacturing sector goes, the services sector follows, and then all of a sudden, all hell eventually breaks loose. But let's take a look here, because if you're looking to deploy money and you know that the manufacturing sector of an economy is contracting, well, let's take a look at the U.S. here, here back to that Philly Fed regional activity data on the manufacturing sector. Here now we're gonna overlay the Wilshire 5000 price index or the total U.S. stock market. And usually when you see a big contraction in manufacturing, well, it does not bode well for the equity market. In fact, it didn't in the dot-com bubble, didn't during the global financial crisis, didn't in 2015, 2016, didn't going into the pandemic, and it's certainly struggling to now as the global economy shrinks. And that is the dangerous part here, is you're starting to see investors and money managers looking to deploy capital, looking for opportunity, but not seeing the bigger picture of what's about to happen. In fact, Sino Ocean said to be in talks with Sonata for financial support. If you don't know who Sonata is, they are a distressed debt manager. They deal with companies that are having major problems with their debt. We said Sino Ocean would likely be one of the next ones. And in September, they said it would suspend payments on all his offshore debt until the securities were restructured or extended to provide a sustainable capital structure. 
The developer owns land in 63 cities in China and overseas with 50 projects in Beijing alone. So again, here you look at it, there's no stability in the property sector here in China, and that means no stability in the economy or the banking sector. But it doesn't stop there because China builder Power Long, well, they just defaulted on their dollar bond payment. You might remember in a prior show, we said more of that was indeed coming. And sure enough, it's here. As a Shanghai-based company said it hadn't made a 15.9 million interest payment on its 5.9% notes due on April 25th, as its liquidity position continues to deteriorate, suggesting the global economy continues to get worse. But just how bad is it in China? Well, people aren't even eating out as much anymore. As China's farmers are forced to let vegetables rot, as demand wanes, and China is grappling with a gloomy jobs market in the ailing property sector, which is a key threat to growth, and data released on Thursday show that economic activity shrank in November, and restaurants and supermarkets have slowed buying of vegetables amid a sluggish economy. Now, the question we started the show out is faced with the same decision that Fidelity is making, would you go out and buy Chinese equities? But one thing you may want to take a look at buying is the stock of our sponsor in today's show, LQR House, on the NASDAQ under the symbol LQR. I want to show you what's going on with this company because this is one of the most heavily shorted stocks out there. The company is making active moves to break all of those out. And what's happening now is we have an analyst that came out on the stock, put a buy signal on, suggesting that their target is more than double its current price. You've got all the information in the pinned comment and description below. Let's check a look at LQR House, the digital face of the alcohol space, and they're a digital powerhouse disrupting the e-commerce world. Our House of Brands has mastered supply, sales, and distribution in the alcoholic beverage market as a one-stop shop for everything related to alcohol. LQR House acquires, builds, markets, and distributes premium bands through its exclusive online networks. And one thing it's done is it's had a one for 60 reverse split that went through this morning. So one of the reasons we're not looking at the stock because it's really difficult to do any sort of analysis immediately after a split. But let's take a look here in a moment at what the analysts had to say and what their Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales has delivered. Because so far, it's looking impressive that this, once those shorts are broken out, this stock could skyrocket. As LQR House has repurchases 3 million shares in an ongoing share buyback program, here we can see that Sean Dollinger said, in our view, the stock price continues to be undervalued amid challenges in the current IPO market and apparent naked shorting affecting new small cap IPOs. Our goal is to persistently buy back the entire 2 million worth of stocks outlined in this program, despite the share price performance remain optimistic about building a powerhouse that will disrupt the age-old alcohol industry. The share buyback program reflects our belief in the undervaluation of the company's shares, demonstrating confidence in the business and a steadfast commitment to long-term opportunities. It also references the point. You break out all these naked shorts, they'll send the stock price flying. And they also have now analyst coverage updates by Litchfield Hills Research reiterating a buy rating and a $5 price target. Now, as of the time of recording, it was trading below $2 a share. And so that tells us that the opportunity here for LQR is quite impressive. As we look forward here, you'll note that what they see in a comprehensive report, they have deemed what is game-changing transactions within LQR House. Notable updates include a strategic acquisition of a leading online marketplace in the alcohol sector, boasting significant significant potential for market expansion. The report also highlights a strongly strong financial position to compete with other acquisitions with 10 million in cash reserves. And now let's take a look at what happened here with their recent sales report as LQR announced that on Black Friday, Americans shattered their online spending records and CW Spirits experienced a substantial surge in both traffic and sales. As the company witnessed a historic surge in sales with its flagship website, cwsspirits.com, contributing significantly to November revenue, which told an impressive 300,000. This amount comprises revenue from both LQR House marketing contracts and sales at cwspirits.com. You put all of these things together and you see a setup of why their stock could go from approximately $1.50 a share where it's trading at the time we're recording to upwards of $5 a share based on the analyst target. But as always, when any company we feature on our show, you're under no obligation to purchase their stock. Be sure to do your own research before placing any trades. With that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.